Thanks, Gary, for your nice, kind words. I was wondering whether you're going to take any more of my time, and I'm happy that you didn't. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I was a little worried because it seemed as if Dennis had about the same topic that I uh, was going to speak on, and I thought we might overlap. But it's beautiful. What he, the way he did it was completely different to the way I'm going to do it. And it's, it's, that's the beautiful thing about biblical truth, that you can take one topic and just find so many things uh, for, from, uh, from the Word about it. Uh, I want to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians 13, 12, sorry, from 1 Corinthians 12. Um, and this is verse 31. He has given a listing of the gifts. He's been talking about gifts. And then he says, do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And then he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then in chapter 4, 14 and verse 1, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So, uh, here Paul is actually in the middle of a discussion on gifts. He, um, he brings in something right in the middle, uh, saying, okay, there, there are these gifts, and uh, you, know, you can earnestly desire them, but God is not bound to give those. You can desire them. But there is something that is uh, non-negotiable. It's not a thing to desire, it's a way. It's a way to follow. And that way is the way of love. So in chapter 13, he talks about love and describes what love is like. So, um, so, so uh, Christianity, in Christianity, love is the way we follow. Um, and um, uh, the, in chapter 14 and verse 1, he says, follow the way of love uh, or Desire, um, uh, I, I don't know what the different translations say, but uh, it says, follow the way of love. Uh, one translation puts it as, make love your aim. So that's the way we follow. And that word, uh, uh, follow, uh, is a word that is used to pursue, to run after, when you're trying to catch somebody. Uh, that's, the, that's the kind of word that is being used, uh, you, uh, is used for this. So we can desire gifts, but we have no option regarding the way of love. And um, uh, th there is no uncertainty as to whether this is for us or not. Uh, we, we, can say, we can't say, uh, God doesn't give me the ability to love, because He's going to give you the ability to love, because it's, it's His calling for all of us. Um, and we, uh, uh, what we have to do is that we have to decide to follow this way. Uh, so, uh, so we decide to go to this person who has hurt us and start talking. And he will help us to talk. And he will help us not to get angry when that person says some silly things in response to what we are saying. Whether we like it or not, we follow the way of love. Uh, we can't say, this is not my personality. We can't say, for example, that I don't like washing dishes. Uh, I know you people have uh, washing machines, I don't know, the, these dishwashing machines. <laughs> but maybe the, the uh, illustration was not all that appropriate, I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you may say, uh, I don't like going to see sick people. But we have to go and do it. Uh, you may say, I don't like visiting this person who insulted me. But that's part, of our, uh, that, that's part of the Christian lifestyle. You might say, I, 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 the, the example I use is, I, you might say, you don't like playing cricket with your son. Now, I know you won't understand that, so I will change it to something a little lower, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you might say, I don't like playing basketball with my son, right? <laughs> but when your son asks you to play basketball, that's something that you do because you love your son and you want to, uh, to be a good father or a good mother to that, to that child. 
Our commander has said, love. And when the commander says, love, we follow. You know, it's like when the commander says, forward march, you don't say, I will do that after I'll have a drink of coffee and come back. You know, that's not the way we follow this master. Now, so if you're a Christian, we are committed to love. Now, God provides this love for, to us, and our job is to obey. So, um, you know, if we did this on our own strength, we won't be able to. We are, we are weak people. We, we won't be able to do it. But we ask God to help us, and He does it for us. So, for example, when, the, when there is a listing of the fruit of the Spirit, the first thing mentioned is love. It's something that comes from the Spirit who indwells us. In 1 John 4:19, uh, John says, "We love because He first loved us. He gave us this love, and He has loved us. And now out of the love that He has loved us, we love Him. Uh, Romans 5:5, 5, we talked about that this afternoon in the breakout session. Uh, it says, "God's love has been poured into our hearts." And we said that the word has the idea of flooded. His love has been flooded into our hearts. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul says, um, God's love controls us. That word is a little difficult to translate. So there are different translations. One translates as, uh, 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 His love compels us. The old Bibles say, His love constrains us. The word really means to press. So, for example, in Luke, when Jesus was going to the home of Jairus, you remember he, he, a woman touched the hem of his garment? And it said the crowd pressed on him. And it's the same word that's used here, pressed. So God's love comes into us and presses us into action. So, in our life, it is important for us to be in touch with God. And when we are in touch with God, His love flows in. And when His love flows in, his love flows out because it is that kind of love that flows in. Uh, this is why, of course, it's important for us to be in touch with God. Uh, I tell our staff in Youth for Christ, uh, our job is to go into the world and to minister to hurting people. And when you do that, you're going to get bashed. So you get bashed, you come back home, get your batteries charged by spending time with God, and then you go back into the world and get bashed again. And then you come back. You come back and uh, get your batteries charged by being with God, and then we go back again. So there is an inexhaustible supply of love with God. Our job is to be in touch with God, and once we are doing that, once we do that, uh, we, we can love. However, this love doesn't automatically happen. You know, it's not something like falling in love. Most you use that phrase because it, there's not much effort involved. You know, you suddenly realize, my goodness, I'm in love with this person. You fall in love, you know. It's not like that with Christian love. Because it's a, our love, Christian love, is a decisive love. It's a love that, we, that, that just doesn't happen. We make it to happen. Because, and that's why there are so many commands in the Bible for us to love, love one another, Beloved, let us love one another. You know, so many times you are told, love. Uh, it's given as a command, even though it's something that God does through us. Because we are called to love people who are difficult to love. We are called to love our enemies. We are called to love those who hurt us. We are, uh, and very often when we love people, no one sees and we may not get any credit for it. Very often we love people who can't repay. This is not natural kind of loving. It's a radical kind of loving. But we decide, and when we decide, God helps us to do it. God's love is inexhaustible. Obedience is what opens the floodgates of this inexhaustible resource. When we obey, the love can flow through our lives into the lives of others. Uh, this afternoon I talked about Corrie ten Boom. A lady who, uh, who, because they helped, uh, kept Jews in their home during the Second World War, uh, she, uh, the, she and her sister and her father and her brother were arrested. The mother was dead, 
And uh, uh, Corrie and her sister spent some terrible years in a, in a concentration camp in a place called Ravensbrook. And um, after that, she went out and she, she was released and then she went about preaching the message of love. Once she was preaching close to where she had spent those terrible years, and after she had finished speaking, a person came up to her and she didn't recognize him until he looked up and, he told, and she realized who this man is. And this man was one of the guards, the wicked guards in this concentration camp. And he said, uh, I don't know whether you, uh, you, uh, you know me, but I was also at Ravensbrook. And, and he said, you know, I have uh, become a Christian since then. And I know that God has forgiven me. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, will you forgive me? And he had put his hand out. And she was clutching her purse. She didn't want to put her hand out. How could she forgive this man? She remembered her sister, um, uh, you know, all her clothes removed, having to walk in front of this guy as he, uh, uh, to parade in front of her. She thought of her sister's slow, painful death in that concentration camp. And he thought, was this all in vain? And and, um, but, but then another part of her said how people who had not forgiven had become cripples, spiritual, emotional cripples, had ruined their life. She also remembered that Jesus had said that if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. But she didn't feel it. She didn't feel like giving up, giving this man her hand of, of friendship. And, um, and so she said, Lord, I don't have the feeling. But then she remembered that obedience doesn't depend on the temperature of the heart. These are her words. And so she put out her hand. Uh, woodenly, she says. And it was like suddenly a current started on her shoulder and raced down her hand. And she clutched this man's hand and said, I forgive you, my brother with all my heart. She said she had never experienced God's love like that before. There was something that seemed impossible to do. It was a decision she had to make. But once she made the decision, God gave her the love to do it. So that is, that is the kind of love that we are talking about. Not automatic. We have to decide. But when we decide, God gives us the love for it. Um, uh, it's very interesting that the church chose this word agape as the most popular word for love. It was a word that was in existence uh, be even before. Uh, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it appears only 20 times. There were other words for love. But in the New Testament, it appears... Um, 216 times uh, this word agape comes. Uh, 99 times in the uh, epistles of Paul. It seems as if the Christians took a word that was not so common. The more common words were, was eros and philia. Uh, they took a word that was not so common and made it the characteristic word for love in the Christian church. Now, they do use the word Philia also. Uh, but, but this was the word that became the characteristic word of the Christian church. So when the Latin um, Jerome the, translated the Bible into the Latin language, he didn't use the common word for love, amor. He used the word caritas, which had more the sense of a decision to, to help people. So it, it, uh, he, he, And then that's how the the, the King James Version used the word charity, uh, which comes from uh, caritas. So, there, is a, there are some revolutionary thoughts in this Christian understanding of love. One of them is that love is not just a means to an end, it is an end in itself. 
Okay, we'll get on to the next slide, yeah. Uh, in 1 Timothy 1, 5, it says, the aim of our charge or our instruction is love. That's the aim. We are doing this so that you may love. In 1, Cor in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, you remember we said, we pursue love. Uh, or as the Revised Standard Version puts it, we make love our aim. Uh, in Romans 13, 8, uh, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. It's an aim. That's achievement in the Christian life. John 15, 12 and 13, Love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that a man give his life for his friends. So, this is one of the key goals in the Christian's life, to be a loving person. Um, you know, we are used to measuring goals today, and that has been very helpful uh, in helping us to become an efficient people. Um, it's very difficult, however, to measure love. Um, you know, so we hear people say, I'll help her so that she will become a great person. I'll train her so that she will get a gold medal, you know, which is a measurable goal that we can have. Sometimes, however, now that's good, that's very good, but sometimes our work is, I'll help her, period. That's, that's it. Measurable, measurable goals are important. Uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we have this idea, oh, he's a faithful person. You know, the word faithful has got a bad name because we think of people who don't achieve much, who don't work very hard, but they just do their work and say he's a faithful person. You know, in, in, in Christianity, uh, we are burning with a passion to please God. So we will try new things. We will do whatever ca we can to, to bring honor and glory to God. Uh, so, so, so just faithfulness is, is not enough in life, usually. We must find the best way to achieve the most in the shortest time with the use of the least amount of, uh, of, of resources. We need to be efficient and effective. So we are always looking for new methods, for creativity. Risk-taking is an important factor in the progress of a group of people. That is important for progress and productivity. But that's not all there is to life. There's a deeper, more basic aspect in life. Our deep goal in life is to be loving. The measurable goal there is, I have loved so and so. Not by loving I was able to achieve so much, which is very good. But sometimes we will say, I will help him. Uh, sometimes you will say, I will help him to make him great. Other times, I care for this dying, helpless pauper. I will change and wash his soiled clothes. I will help him die with dignity. Sometimes that is what we are called to do. Um, I'm, I'm so encouraged that the church has recently recovered the, 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 the wonderful Christian practice of adoption. And, um, and um, Christians are adopting others uh, just like God adopted us into his family. Uh, now, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. But sometimes uh, the adoptive child may go astray and, uh, and become a rebel and bring great pain to the parents. Now, was that wasted energy? No. We love that person. People deserve to be loved. And whether that person accepted it or not, we did what was necessary for that person. We have been Christians. We have loved. So, um, so this is, uh, th this is the, the Christian understanding of love. Um, this, uh, this year, we, uh, the, the church in, in the States mourned the passing of one of its great heroes, a man called Robertson um, McQuilkin. He died a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I think. And uh, 
He was a president of Columbia International University, uh, a rising star in the evangelical field. His books were very appreciated. He was a very good speaker and a hero to many people, including me. I really liked his stuff, what he wrote. And then, but, but his wife got Alzheimer's disease. And um, she had it for 25 years. In the year 1990, he realized that she cannot be without him, that she gets very nervous and and uh, cannot move around, uh, can, can, cannot survive without him being around. So, at the prime of his career, he resigned as president of Columbia International University to look after his wife. In 1993, that's three years later, she stopped recognizing him. And he, she lived for another ten years. And during those 10 years, he cared for her. She didn't, re have, she didn't respond uh, to his love in any way that generally, that, that, that showed uh, that he was, uh, she was appreciating it. But there was fulfillment in loving the person I have loved. I have loved the person I have loved. In fact, when he resigned, he read out a statement, and one of the things he said is, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. It's not my obligation. <clears throat> it's my privilege. So for the Christians, loving is an achievement. This is why Bi the Bible uses competitive language relating to love. In Romans 12, 10, it says, outdo one another in showing honor. That's, what, that's our competition here. We are competing to show other people more honor than they show us. <clears throat> Love is a success that we strive to achieve. Uh, you know, with this approach, you're not going to be disillusioned and angry when people don't respond to your love. Whether they respond or not, we are just being Christians when we love. And therefore, we are, it, it's not a waste. And of course, we know that very often people will respond uh, later on. Now, <clears throat> people will ask, this is a very selfish world, and pe selfishness has become uh, quite respectable. Uh, and uh, today we admire people when people talk about themselves and brag about themselves. Uh, we say, hey, hey, look at him, he's so confident. And we, 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 we look at this with, once we looked at it with disdain, now we look at it with a sense of envy. And we wonder, is it really worthwhile being so cult culturally uh, alien to, to have this type of selfless attitude towards people? You know, uh, there are many reasons why we believe that love is worthwhile. I'll just give a few. Um, in, this imp in, the, in this passage, in chapter 13, of 1 Corinthians, uh, in verse 8, it says, love never ends. It's something that's going to last. That's one thing it says. Then towards the end, it talks about all these gifts and says that those are not going to last because there will become a time when we don't need these gifts. And then in verse 13, it says, now abide, these are the things that last, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Okay, now, what, what's so great about love? Let me suggest three reasons, very personal reasons. There are a lot of reasons that make love worthwhile. But I want to suggest to you three reasons. Firstly, you know, when we are walking with God and we are obeying God, God has a way of giving us delight along the way. Just to know, to know that you are being God's servant. Uh, while I was teaching the Trinity course, uh, I suddenly looked at my, uh, at my watch and I realized, oh, today is my 40th anniversary in Youth for Christ and in Christian ministry. Uh, it's today. And uh, as... <clears throat> As 
As I think of 40 years of ministry, you know, uh, some people tell me, oh, you have sacrificed a lot staying in this country. Uh, and I tell, man, I haven't sacrificed anything. Because being where God wants you to be is the place where you're fulfilled. And if you're a happy person, what, what sacrifice is that? You know? And I just want to give you an example uh, of, of, of the excitement of following the greatest leader and being involved in the greatest cause. Uh, <clears throat> I was getting ready to come for a big conference in the States. Uh, I think some of you all have gone for this Urbana, Urbana Missionary Conference. And um, I was leaving on Christmas night to come to Chicago. And uh, <clears throat> um, I, I, it was very important for me that I sleep well because I was going to speak, and you know, if you are having jet lag, uh, you know, as it is when I preach, my he becomes she and she becomes he. And if I'm with jet lag, it's going to be much more. So I was a little worried. And so I thought I must have a good sleep. But I was preaching in my church on Christmas morning. Uh, and so I prepared my message and finished up at about 2 o'clock. And uh, the service was at about 8 o'clock. So I went to bed, uh, and uh, I had maybe slept for half an hour or a few minutes, I don't know. There was a knock at our door. Next door to our family, we have a very poor family. <clears throat> they are not Christians, they are Hindus. Uh, they, um, uh, this family, uh, they, they, are, they, they didn't at that time have electricity in their home. And the child was having a stomach ailment, and they wanted to give some medicine to this child, and it was very dark. And instead of giving uh, the medicine for the stomach, they gave the child some skin lotion. Uh, and uh, they came and knocked at our door and said, what can we do? So I uh, said, let's go to the hospital. So I took, put them in our Youth for Christ van and took them to the hospital, and uh, because they are quite poor, and sometimes the poor are not treated as well as they should be. I thought I must stay till everything is over. So I stayed till about 6.30 uh, in the morning, and then quickly came, no sleep. I went and took the service at church. But in the afternoon, uh, I thought, now is my time to have a good nap <laughs> and, <laughs> and get ready for the trip. So in our, in our country, we, we, it's not like in the States, you all open your windows like this. In our country, we open our windows like this. We don't have air conditioning and, and things like that. So uh, usually, if somebody's at home, the windows are open. If no one's at home, the windows are closed. So we closed all the windows in my house, <laughs> hoping that people will think no one is at home. Uh, put the van in the garage, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and I went to sleep. Slept a few minutes, knock at the door. <laughs> Somebody wants to see my brother who lives next door, and he wasn't there, so he came to ask where he is. So, of course, I was not happy, but I had to smile, you know, so I smiled and <clears throat> told him, and then went back to bed. Again, another knock. <clears throat> and after that second knock, I thought, well, Christmas Day afternoon is not the best time to sleep. So my children, we, our family got together and we started playing some games. But I needed my sleep. So I went at midnight to the airport and got on to a flight of the Sri Lankan National Airline. There were about 300 seats on that flight and about 50 passengers, which meant that I had four or five, I can't remember how many, four seats, I think, four seats to, my, to myself. And I made a nice bed out of it. <laughs> we went nonstop from Colombo to Amsterdam. And shortly after I got onto the flight, I fell asleep, and I got up shortly before Amsterdam. I had never slept like that on a flight. Never before, never after. <laughs> <clears throat> and when I got up, I thought to myself, God knew all along. He knew that when these people came in the middle of the night, 
asking for help. That poor Sri Lankan Airlines was going to have a disastrous flight to Amsterdam. A total loss for them and a great gain for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of those things. For me to live is Christ. And when you have Christ, you have a wonderful Savior to follow. That's one of the things that make it worthwhile. A second thing that makes it worthwhile is that we become beautiful people. You know, when you love, you become a beautiful person. In, in, one, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says that beholding uh, the face of God uh, unveiled, we are transformed from, into His image from one degree of glory to another. And this is one of the things uh, in my ministry, I haven't had the privilege of ministering to much to people from very nice, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what you call these decent, nice, I don't know what those words are, but anyway, you know, I haven't had the opportunity of ministering to people like that. Most of the people I minister to have come from rough, tough backgrounds. And I've seen the way slowly, slowly, God molds them to beautiful people. Uh, I want to tell you one story. <clears throat> this lady, uh, actually her brother, uh, was a carnival. She, uh, he and his wife were carnival singers. They lived a wild life. Uh, and he was an alcoholic. He, was, uh, he used to do, uh, uh, you, know, um, ha uh, uh, you know, gambling. He was, he was addicted to gambling and to alcohol. And um, most of the, the glassware, the, the plates and everything was broken because when he gets drunk and angry, he would just break everything. And a friend of his invited him to come to one of our club, uh, camps. He came to the camp and listened to everything very carefully, didn't give his life to Christ, went home, thought about what he had heard. And he became a Christian. He wrote to me. And he said, I have now become a Christian. And then he said, joy, 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 joy. You know, several, several times he, he kept saying, joy, joy, joy. Uh, <clears throat> his life was transformed. But his wife was used to another kind of lifestyle. She was used to the carnival. And, um, and she was not happy. So they had some very serious problems shortly after he was converted. So we thought we'll have them over to our home. Uh, the idea was for them to come for two weeks, and they ended up staying for 17 years. Uh, but, uh, but it was one of those beautiful things that happened to us, because he was a natural evangelist. And I was a Bible teacher. And the two of us helped restart a church that had gone to zero. He brought the people, I preached the gospel, <laughs> you know. And that's the church that we worship in right now. So it was a beautiful uh, combination. Uh, and the wife, of course, became a Christian, and now she's on fire for the Lord. Uh, but her sister, her sister saw the change in the brother's life. The sister worked and used to often have, she was single, she would often give all the money she has to feed this family because this guy was wasting all the money with alcohol and gambling. And she saw this life change and she got attracted to Christianity. She was a Buddhist. And um, so she... Um, but she had a fairly serious problem. She often had nervous breakdowns. She would often spend time in hospital with this nervous break. She would often get nervous breakdowns. But she was attracted to the Christian lifestyle, and she became a Christian. Uh, we realized later that she was converted later. She followed Jesus before she accepted Jesus as her savior. Uh, and sometimes people come through that routine. So she became a Christian. 
and her psychological problems didn't change. We saw her, uh, especially if she gets scolded in office, we see her getting nervous and scared. And when we realized that she may be coming close to a breakdown, we would bring her to our home and she would stay and then recover and go back. But over the years, we saw this lady change. She was loved by Jesus. And that love made a difference in her life. She was a nervous person. And nervous people make wonderful prayers. <laughs> because they get scared. And so when they get scared, they pray. And suddenly we realized, this lady has the gift of prayer. And she would pray for people. When we get sick, sometimes she's more worried about our sickness than, uh, the, than us. She's more worried. And so whenever I would have a problem and I'm traveling, there's a need, I call my wife, tell her, tell her name was Indramani. Tell Indramani to pray. Because we knew that she prays. And then um, she would also um, started going and helping people. She would go to um, um, to homes where elder, homes for the elders, and these people couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't write letters. So she'll go, she'll write letters for them, she will read for them, and she just kept going from place to place, helping people. My mother-in-law once needed a certain color button, uh, and she went, I don't know how many miles she walked, going from shop to shop, finding the button. When my wife and I used to travel and our children were small, we would ask her to come to look after our children because we trusted her as being a loving person. My wife was once sick when my daughter had to go for an operation and we had to go to a different town. So she came with my daughter and we went with, because we knew she cared for them. One of her great concerns was that, because she was single, and uh, she, she didn't have anybody really because the, her brother was, uh, by now he had become paralyzed. He's still a wonderful Christian, but he's paralyzed now from his waist down. Um, and so she said, I don't want to be a trouble to anybody. Uh, and I want God to take me before I am a trouble to anybody. And don't pray prayers like this, but in her case, God answered. <laughs> uh, one day she was going to church, she was walking to church. And a bus didn't see her and knocked her and she died on the spot. And, uh, and we had a, a funeral for her. She said, now when I die, please don't have a funeral. You just take my body from the, from the hospital and bury it somewhere. Uh, but we, we had it in a home. We had it in a funeral home. And the place was packed. All people whose lives she had touched. Now here's a person who never really overcame her weaknesses uh, in the sense that she took medicine until the day she died. She took her psychiatric medicine. But Jesus had turned her into a beautiful person. That's what God can do when we allow His love to transform us. So that's my second reason why I say it's worthwhile. The third reason comes from this fact that it says, love abides. In other words, what we do in this life has its repercussions in the next also. The judgment, at the judgment, our loving deeds will be mentioned. You know, chapter 25 of Matthew, where there is this judgment. And... Uh, this person is told, you know, you, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was in prison and you visited me. And this person didn't even remember. When did I do this? Because it seemed to be such insignificant work, you know. But at the judgment, it was mentioned. And it was considered to be something that is very important. John Wesley said, Give and write down so much deposited in the bank of heaven. When we love, 
we are making an investment. An investment, a very productive investment, in a place that will not suffer economic downturn, where there is no inflation, there is no stock market crashing. That place, our, our investment is just going to grow and grow and grow. You know, it's amazing how much the Bible talks about judgment. And we talk so little about it. It is from the judgment that we get a lot of our values. The worthwhileness of what we do is best checked or evaluated on how it's going to fare at the judgment. I think a Christian should be thinking all the time, every day, about the judgment. Because what we are doing is we are preparing for the judgment. And we don't do that by just sleeping. We do that by serving. By, because God, who created this world, has sent us to this world to be His agents of restoration of the world. So we serve Him. But we may not receive the response that we expect or wish. But we know that when we do this at the end of it, there is going to be a reward. I want to close with a, a story that I read when I was a, a teenager. And it really influenced the way I think about life. Uh, this is about a doctor in the southern part of the United States of America. And um, he felt that God had called him to work among the poor. This was many years ago. And uh, he went to a poor village, set up his, uh, his business above a tailoring establishment upstairs, and he would have this business of his. And um, he thought it was uh, uh, that he, uh, he's going to serve these people. So in the morning, night, people would come, and he would serve them. And, um, and, one, uh, and uh, by and by, uh, his name was Dr. Brackett. Dr. Brackett uh, fell in love. And he, it was time for his wedding. As he was getting ready for the wedding, suddenly he got this urgent call. There's a woman who's going to have a baby. This was before ambulances, before cars and buses and things like that. A lady who's going to, a Spanish lady who's going to have a baby. And uh, there are some problems, uh, and they're, they're in distress. Will the doctor please come and help? Now, Dr. Brackett had a real problem. Is he going for his wedding, or is he going to save the life of this child? And um, now, this is no excuse for neglecting our spouses, okay? But, <laughs> but on this particular instance, he realized that he, he's, he needs to save two lives. So he went, performed the operation, and delivered the baby. And by the time it was over, it was long past the time of the wedding. And so he didn't go to the church, he went to the bride's home. And as you can imagine, she was angry. <laughs> she thought, if this is what you're going to do to me on my wedding day, I can just imagine what life with you is going to be like. And so she broke the engagement. Dr. Brackett never got married. He never left that village. He served all his life. His, his friends in medical school may have thought, what a failure this guy is. Look at him, a poor man. After all these years of, minis of, of medicine. And when he was an old man, he died. And they had a great funeral for him. Everyone in the village came to pay homage to this great servant of the village. Now, after some time, the village elders got together and said, we must put a nice epitaph for him. And this lady, whose life he had saved, would regularly go to the cemetery to see, uh, have they put the epitaph? And nothing had been put. So finally, she decided, if they're not going to do something, I must do something. 
So she went to his office. And there was that brass plate. She unscrewed the brass plate. And she took it and kept it on the tomb of Dr. Brackett. The next morning, an undertaker was passing by and he saw this brass plate shining in the sunlight, turned aside to look what it was, and this is what it said. Dr. Brackett, office upstairs. <laughs> he had an office upstairs. And all the years of deprivation, as he lived for other people, would have seemed as if it was nothing in comparison to an eternity of rejoicing in the work that Christ has done in his life. My dear friends, it's worthwhile. Don't get fooled by a society that has chosen to follow the path of selfishness. Don't get fooled. Don't feel envious when people show the, the marks, the external signs of success. Don't get fooled by that. We are called to follow the greatest leader and we are involved in the greatest cause. Let's be faithful to that call. Let's pray. Oh God, what a wonderful thing to think that you called us. Father, with all our shortcomings, all our weaknesses, still you chose us to be your representatives on earth. What a privilege, Lord. Father, some of us are going through a tough life, but we know that even that tough life is going to bear witness to the toughness of the gospel, to the strength of the gospel. Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and seeing that just like Jesus, seeing the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, we too may run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus and realizing that it's worth it. It's worth it here because we have you and when we have you, we have enough to fulfill our lives. And it's worth it in the hereafter, because then we become partakers of your glory. What a glorious thought, O oh Lord. We thank you for calling us to be your servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.